Welcome everyone to Textiles and Tea with the Ham Weavers Guild of America. I'm Kathy Group. I'm the Advertising Manager and I get to be your host today. We are so excited. We have a sponsor, Patricia Jean Gordon. Thank you, Patricia. We appreciate you supporting Textiles and Tea. If you would like to uh, sponsor Textiles and Tea, you too, as an individual, as well as a guild or a business, can do that. As always, we'll take questions at the end of the session today, the last 15 minutes. Uh, if you would put your questions in the Q&A and not in the chat, love your comments in the chat. Those are great, but I can't always see those and I know I'll see them in the Q&A. Today, we are very excited to have Liz Albert Fay here today. And Liz got a degree in textiles design at the program in the artist, artistry at Boston University in 1981. Um, she creates art quilts uh, exhibited nationally and in Japan, and these can be found in private and corporate co collections and in many publications. In 1998, Liz became intrigued with the traditional rug hooking and began pushing the art form in new directions, and you will see that today. The artist practice, studio practice has evolved into including innovative contemporary <laughs> hand uh, hand hooked rugs and large scale installations, sometimes incorporating a variety of textile techniques and making use of mixed media, as you can see in this image with the stump. She uses embroidery, punch needle embroidery, various hand quilting, stitching techniques can be found within the same piece. These award winning works have appeared in many juried shows, invitational museum exhibits private and museum collections. And we are so excited to have her here today. Hey, Liz. Hi, Kathy. Turn, there you, turn your camera back on. Oh. <laughs> Hi, Kathy. Hi, Tech. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. It's good to have you here. It's nice to be here. All right, very first question. What is your favorite tea? Well, I like all different kinds of teas, as long as they're herbal. I don't do caffeine. And today I'm drinking um, lemon ginger. Lemon ginger? Yep. Ooh, that sounds refreshing. Yeah, it is. Um, so tell us, if you would, how did you get started? You have a long history of being in fiber. Well, how did you get started in fiber? Well, I think it was a gradual process. Um, I was really fortunate as a child to have parents who um, signed me up for all different kinds of art classes and a really wonderful grandfather who had all kinds of projects that um, sort of taught me how to use my hands. And um, he also really sparked my imagination. And I think one of the best things that he um, gave me was um, really a curiosity about how things were made. So when I was in high school, I wanted to learn how to do um, what at the time I thought of it as early American crafts. Mm -hmm. And I started to teach myself how to do things out of books. So the first thing I can remember was a really simple patchwork quilt that I gave to a boyfriend. And I saved my money and then bought a spinning wheel and learned how to spin from a book. And then I, I saved up again and bought a uh, four harness, four harness uh, floor loom and decided I wanted to learn how to weave, but that wasn't so easy from a book. <laughs> so um, I decided, well, you know, that's what I wanted to study in college. So I did go to art school and I double majored in weaving and surface design. And that was really sort of the beginning of my, um, my formal education in textiles. Well, I'm amazed how much you have learned out of a book. I think that's hard to learn anything out of a book yeah, that you do with your hands. Good for you. Well, I think, you know, people learn in different ways, and um, mm -hmm. that seems to be sort of easy for me. Well, many of your works have meaning or symbolism, as we can see in this next piece. This is called I See You. So if you would, would you talk some about the this work and its meaning behind all these different parts of it? Sure. So the title I See You could be taken in two different ways. And um, I created this piece in 2016 before our presidential election. And I was invited to be a featured artist in a big rug hooking show in Vermont. And I thought this would be a great opportunity to speak about something that was really important to me. So I live down the street, I live in Sandy Hook, Connecticut, and I live down the street from the elementary school where the oh. shooting took place in 2012. And um, 
at that time, there wasn't as many mass shootings as we're having now. And I thought it would be a really good opportunity to talk about how this affected my community. So um, I started with the trees and I had been taking photographs. Um, I was teaching in Seattle and I saw a grove of aspen trees mm -hmm. and they have what looks like eyes all over the trunks. And so I was intrigued by that. So I started with the eyes and they sort of represent to me that we don't know who's watching us, but we also need to be watching out for ourselves. And um, along those lines, I decided that I was going to um, dye the background this sort of eerie green to sort of make you uncomfortable, um, you know, just right from the start. The gun is orange because that's um, the color for gun awareness. And that's the assault rifle that was used in this shooting. So there were 20 first graders and six adults that were killed that day within five minutes. And um, so I made 26 flowers. The smaller ones are um, representing of the children and the six for the adults. And they're done with punched needle embroidery. And each one is individual because you know that's how people are too, everybody's individual. And the grass was done with a technique that I sort of developed. It's sort of a, a variation on row cooking and has a lot of different materials um, combined in there. And I wanted to, um, the premise behind the whole piece was that I felt that every child has a right to feel safe in their home, in their school, and in their community. And I wanted somehow to represent the home in there too, and sort of struggled that, with that for a while, and eventually decided to do what um, sort of what I thought a wallpaper would look like in the background. And, um, you know, talking about things that are hard. Um, you know, subject matter that's hard. I always feel like there needs to be hope. And so that's what the birds represent to me is, you know, um, a reason to have hope. So is the wallpaper concept the reason for the little juxtaposition at the top, well, not juxtaposition, the little jet at, at the, the top? top? No, it's just because um, I have sort of this thing now where I do mostly things with irregular edges and it doesn't feel right most of the time to me to just have it be too straightforward. I like that, I like that. Um, I just wanna remind people, this this is rug hooking. I mean, right, it's traditional rug hooking. When you look at it, it could be a painting. It's really hard to tell at a distance. I should have put a detail, but we will have details. Okay. But just to remind people, this is rug hooking. And this is why I was so amazed when I saw your work, is just how detailed it is in a technique that's not known for detail, not like this. So, and we'll see more. Um, it's a technique that's not known to a lot of people either, so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I love your, and I, I have to ask you this. The question is, I love your rugs. Are you okay with me calling them rugs? Yes, it's fine. Okay, Because they're not like, you know, throw it down on the floor kind of rugs. These are right. artwork. Right. But the next one we're gonna look at, I loved it because of the negative space. Okay. And hooked art, when hooked art is a good word too. Hooked hook art. art. Okay. Yeah. Um, in this next piece of hook art, we have a lot of negative space. And I liked in your introduction, you talked about how you pushed the limits of what rug hooking is. And this is a great example of this. So to start with, just make sure everybody's clear. Would you tell you a little bit what is negative space in, in your mind, how you see negative space? Sure. And then just talk some about the open spaces and the edges. Okay. that you mentioned earlier. Okay. Negative space is the space between things. So, um, you know, a positive image in this here would be the circles. They, they exist. But what I tried to, I tried to do in, in this piece was have three challenges for myself. And one had to do with the negative space. So the spaces that are cut out between the circles and also the dark spaces are all the negative space. And so my challenge was for all of it to read as negative space. I also um, wanted to see how much I could cut away and still have the piece hold its integrity. Mm. And my third challenge was to use co uh, color combinations that were really unusual. Instead of doing combinations in each circle that I knew would work, I tried to put things together that I thought wouldn't work and then try to pull each circle together so that um, it felt cohesive to me. So there's always, there's one circle that I'm not really pleased with um, but when I tell people that, um, not everybody knows which circle it is, because I think everybody really has a different way of, of looking at everything. 
And this piece was inspired by a wood pile that was at the base of a, a hiking trail. And I was thinking about how, um, you know, when people are hiking past or animals are walking by, there's different weather um, situations that these trees all really have stories. Mm. Now that they're cut down, sort of those stories are lost. Sorry, are you going to tell us the one you don't like? Can you guess? <laughs> no, they're beautiful. There's none of them I don't like. It's the green one on the bottom um, towards the left. Oh, you don't like the color combination? Yeah, there's something about that. It's still not my favorite. <laughs> We're also critical, aren't we? Aren't we? Yeah. yeah. Um, the next series is called the Winter Series. And would you talk to us about what was the connection with these works? Was, was it the, the theme or the something visual or something completely different? And we're only showing two of them. Um, I encourage people to go to your website because there is a whole series of these and I just chose two. Right. Well, these also have to do with negative space. Um, I decided that um, there was a point in time where I was looking outside and really being inspired by, by what I saw in the different seasons. And so I was looking at the negative spaces uh, between the branches of trees. So I walk a lot. And when you look up and you see the, um, you know, the different shapes that are created. So I gave myself about an hour and I cut about 25 different pieces of paper and just really quickly just drew one after another um, images that were sort of in my mind. And then as the season progressed, I would choose um, one of those drawings and then try to um, capture the season. So the one on the right is called Burning Bush. And uh, we have these, um, these bushes or shrubs in Connecticut that are called Burning Bush. And they change to be all these different colors in the fall. They're bright pink, um, red, really intense colors. And so I tried to capture that in that piece. And then the one on the left um, is called Front and Center Snowy Day. And it was about a particular day um, when we buried my father-in-law in upstate New York. And there was a lot of snow and ice on the ground. It was a very small cemetery. So we um, walked up a steep hill at the back uh, where he was going to be buried. And um, in front of me going up this hill was my sister-in-law. And for some reason, she had her camera that day and she snapped a picture. And when I heard that click, it sort of um, froze an image in my mind. And so I chose this particular um, drawing to, um, to um, capture that. And he was in the military. So of course there was the flag draped over his casket um, and it's called front and center because that sort of was his personality also. <laughs> um, and then there's also this thing that happens um, when it's very cold outside and it's not snowing, but there's something that I sort of call fairy dust that comes down these little um, flakes of snow. And so I um, stitched on a couple beads there to sort of capture that feeling. On the burning bush one, the polka dot, is that cloth? It is. There's actually okay. that one, and there's a couple of pieces of striped fabric in there, too. Okay. Um, so it's a mixed, in... mixed media kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. And so they're set back a little bit. It gives it a little bit more texture, a little bit more depth. Mm -hmm. You're very much aware of your environment, aren't you? I mean, it's like it influences you a lot. You really pay attention to that, don't you? It does. I grew up, um, my parents were avid outdoors people. We hiked and canoed and camped constantly. So I actually feel more at home outside than I do inside. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, Now, this was the winter series, and we'll be talking about other series too. But I'm curious, when you're doing a series, do you work just on that series or do you work on one series and come back or work on something else and then come back to the series? How does that work for you? Um, I guess I do work in a lot of series and I, I'm i not sure why. I think sometimes I can't really express everything or my, it's not my complete thought. And so I go on you know, in the series until I feel like I'm done. And when I am working on a series, I won't start another series, but I will do other pieces, you know, um, smaller pieces, um, except um, I have been working on this series of portraits since 2004 or seven. 
Um, and so they're, they're ongoing, but everything else, I will work on one series, finish it, and then start another. Well, I love it that we have one of your first rugs you ever did, which, yes. <laughs> I mean, how many of us keep something we made early on? That's wonderful that you have. Um, and you're not a traditionalist, but this one is. This is one of the first ones that you did, right? Yes, it is. I, um, I learned in 1998 um, how to hook. And the way it came about was I was making uh, what people call art quilts now at the time. And my kids were really young and I didn't have chunks of time where I could sit and work at home. And one day I was walking down the street, um, our main street where we have a little historical society. And there was a group of women sitting outside doing something and I stopped to look. And most of them were doing what I consider um, you know, traditional hooked rugs. But there was one woman there who, whose um, rug just sort of blew my mind. Her name is Pat Miracayo, and her colors were really bright. Um, her rug um, was telling a story. It was, um, you know, the center of her design uh, sort of trailed off into the border. I loved everything about it. And I thought, I really want to learn how to do this. And also, um, you know, rug hooking is portable and I could take this to soccer games and do things with my kids and I was able to keep working. So um, I found a woman who very graciously um, said that she would teach me how to hook in her home. She gave me three lessons and then she moved away. So this is sort of an example. She used only the very best wool and it was subdued colors and, um, and in a traditional format. And um, she was going to teach me with a pattern. And I said, you know, I would rather design my own. So I've actually never hooked somebody else's pattern. But um, <clears throat> so these were two of my chickens and I had all these swirls in the background. And she said, you know, you can't do these swirls. That's sort of an advanced technique. And she was right about that. So it was very, very plain. And um, I was thrilled, though, to be, you know, learning something new. And um, I have kept it. Um, it's sort of, I look back at it and I, um, and I think, you know, I've learned a lot. So, you know, because she moved away, um, when she did, I was sort of left without knowing anybody else that hooked. I didn't know where to get materials. Rook hooking is a little mysterious that way. It's not as well known as quilting and, you know, other fiber arts. And so eventually I, I did find other people to hook with and found that the rug hooking community is so welcoming and I learned so much. And because I think that I went on my own, um, I was able to learn from a lot of different people and take you know, different aspects of what, um, you know, what I learned from them to, to create my own work. And this really is the first one you did? Very first run. Okay, all of you who've done rug hooking will agree with me on this. This is amazing. My first rug hooking, you could barely tell what it was. I mean, <laughs> you really had a great skill for it first. I mean, right off the bat, it's just well, amazing. I don't see that when I look at it, but um... I'm sure you don't. <laughs> but it is. I mean, everybody who's rug hooking, you've never done rug hooking, you're all going to agree with me that this is pretty impressive for the very first thing. So well, you know what happened was I, I finished it in, in no time flat, brought it back to her and she turned it over. And when you, you know, people who hook look at the back of people's rugs to sort of see what kind of, you know, craftsmanship there is. And I had missed half of the loops in the brown section. And she explained to me, it's called holiday, a holiday like going on a holiday, you've missed spaces. And so I went back and filled in. So I learned a lesson even with the first rug. So how did, so this woman that you, you saw her work with the color and everything. So after you did this, was it still in the back of your mind that I want to do that color? I want to do the yeah, brightness. I've, I've always been a color person. Um, you know, even when I was in, in school, when I was in college, I was horrible at weaving because of all the math involved. But when I went into the, the dye studio, all that color and the experimenting, it was my thing. So um you know, when I started um, hooking, um, it was the color really that I was after. Well, now we're gonna look at another series. You talk about series, and this may be the one you mentioned a while ago about uh, going to other series. 
This is called Ordinary Extraordinary Women Series, right? And you've been working on this for 20 years, right? 20 years, yeah. And it's going to be exhibited in 2026, right? Yes, yeah. So this has so much of your time and your energy and your passion, obviously. So how did all of this begin and continue? Um, well, this is um, a portrait of Ruth Spring, who was 92 years old when I hooked her portrait. And she is sort of, was sort of um, related to me by marriage. And she invited my daughter and I to um, go to her garden. She had an organic garden and to um, pick some vegetables. So Ruth um, lives in a, lived at a little town in upstate New York. And um, at the time that I made her portrait, she had very bad arthritis. And so her family would put a chair out in the middle of the garden and she would orchestrate, you know, go over here and pick that or, or do this. And, and, you know, we would sort of fall in line. And um, so on this particular day, we picked our vegetables. Um, we went to get back in our car. And she said to my daughter, Chelsea, you need to go pick some of those onions before you leave. They are as sweet as apples. So we get back in the car and we're both starving. And I look over and Chelsea's eyes are just streaming. You know, she said, Ruth lied to me. Those onions do not taste like apples. So that's sort of what, um, you know, to tell this story is what sort of inspired me to get started. So this really does tell the story of Ruth. Um, we, she and I would sit by the wood stove every Christmas and we would talk about um, what seeds we were buying next year for our gardens and what successes and what failures we had had that year. And so I knew what all her favorite vegetables were. And so they're um, depicted here. And um, the Adirondack, uh, the pack basket is sort of a symbol of the Adirondacks. And she, Ruth lived in the same house her entire life. And when she was very young, they planted an apple tree by the front door. And um, by the time that I knew her, this apple tree was hanging over the door and you had to duck to get inside the house. So family lore said that when the tree went, Ruth would go. So Ruth passed away um, just a few years after I made her portrait and the family cut down the apple tree. So, um, so that's the story of, of Ruth. And, um, you know, I wasn't sure. I had never hooked a person before, and especially an elderly person. And well, she hooked the rug. You're back. I'm back. Did I go away? I don't know if you did or I did. Oh, I don't know. Um, anyway, they, um, it, she loved the rug. And so that sort of inspired me to continue on. And so that's how the series started. Are you there, Kathy? Now, uh, let's see what's going on here. Stand by. Oh, good. I'm glad that you can see me. Somebody's <laughs> in the chat. Thank you. I'm back. Okay, I can see you. Did I go away? I don't know. They're saying that they could see you. Oh, okay, good. I don't know where I went. All of a sudden, my screen was gone. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask about is visually. I love the design on this with the, the limbs going over. It just encapsulates her so beautifully, along with the chair and everything. I love the design of this. Oh, thank you. Now, when you design something like this, do you draw it out several times? Do you kind of wing it? How do you design? Um, I didn't have a studio at the time. I worked on the kitchen floor and I could just remember I rolled out. We have a local newspaper still in our town. Uh -huh. And at the time you could get the ends of the rolls of the newsprint. And I remember rolling it out on the floor and I just drew it, um, worked on it that way. Do you find that you, um have to uh, redraw it several times? Do you go over and over again? Or do you feel like the first time it, it works for you? Um, no, I, you know, I, I think I, I drew it and then I would make changes on it. That's the way I usually work now is um, I start something and then it's not pretty, 
I, uh -huh. cut, I paste and I paint and I do whatever it takes to, you know, get the design however I want it to look. Okay. I'm gonna make sure we're still good. I think we may be off the air and I can't, can't tell. I'm gonna keep talking. If we are, we'll, we'll get it later. Okay. <laughs> um, oh, they're saying we're on. Okay. Yeah. Okay, here, thank you. Fine. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, let's keep going. Um, So we're, when you design something like this, how do you find your materials? Do you, um, do you, I, so you said you love dyeing. Do you still dye? Do you go out and is it a matter of, okay, here's the color I want, or here's enough material of that color. So I'm going to use that. Um, most of the materials that I use are recycled. Um, in this particular piece, that background with all the swirls is a hand dyed wool and um, also the, the um, lavender flowers that have a, a variation. You get a lot of movement with things that are hand dyed. Most of my wools are recycled clothing, um, things that I've either inherited from other people or um, you know, at this point I've been hooking for a long time. I have a lot of wool, um, but I do buy white and black um, bolts of wool. And oh. I do hand dye um, when there's a color that I need or something that, um, that needs more you know, variety. Um, the next piece that we're going to look at is uh, a variety of things. And this st really struck me because you do a lot of things. <laughs> you know, you've got, you started off on one thing, you've kind of worked your way through, you do a variety of, of modalities. So when you talk to people and they say, what do you do? What do you tell them? Do you say you're a, um, a rug, rug hook artist? Do you say you're a sculpture? Do you say you're a basket ma maker? Or what do you see yourself as? I tell people I'm a textile artist because uh -huh. I think that sort of narrows it down, even though that's a broad category. But I think of myself, I think more just as an artist or just somebody who makes things because, um, you know, every day, at least every day, I make creative um, decisions, whether it's, you know, how you put your food on the plate or how I'm, you know, laying out my vegetable garden for next year. There, there are choices that you make and um, things that you're doing with your hands all the time. So I guess I just think of myself as a creative person. <laughs> a multi-talented creative person. Thank you. <laughs> um, in these three pictures, this one on the left, I want to focus in on, I just... This is so beautiful. It's so delicate. Would you please explain this piece, what it's made out of, and how you came up with this brilliant idea? Sure. Um, well, each year in my garden, I try to grow something new, and um, I like to experiment. And my choice is some, either something that I want to taste, you know, um, something new like that, or something that's really beautiful, or something that's really interesting. And the milk thistle um, sort of fit all those three categories for me. So the milk thistle grow plant goes really large and the leaves are sort of um, jagged and they're dark green and have a lot of white lines growing through them. And it grows a stalk with a purple flower, just like um, thistles that you see in the wild. Oh. And, um, and then the seeds, when the flower goes to seed, um, it, it forms these seed hairs that have a seed attached to them. And when they blow in the wind, that's how they you know, receive themselves in, in various places. So, um, you know, it's very fleeting. And I love the way the sun was hitting um, the seed hairs. And so I decided to um, try to string them and make this piece. And what I really love about this piece is that um, they're in the plexiglass box and just strung on these um, pieces of rayon thread, which also sort of sparkle. And um, even if somebody walks by it and the floor just moves a little bit, they sort of, um, they move inside the box. And um, so it's almost like it's always alive. And I like the idea of putting something natural in a plexiglass box because it's a way of preserving nature. It's a way of appreciating it. 
and also calling um, attention to something in the environment. I think by you know finding things that are really beautiful and pointing them out, it makes us more aware of our surroundings. That's just so lovely. It just, it's probably a good thing it's in a plexiglass box. I would just wanna be in it. You know, <laughs> it just feels like it would feel so good kind of writing down. Yeah. It's beautiful. Oh, thank you. Um, you well, like to, I'm sorry. I didn't say anything. Oh, kind of blurp there. You use um, a lot of recycle and natural materials, right? Right. And why is that important to you? Well, like everybody else, I think there's a lot of waste in the world. And um, so I don't really want to contribute to that. Um, but I also like um, the history of things. Like if I go to a flea market and I find fabric that has a history of its own, or it makes you a little nostalgic, or it's just made in a way that we're not used to anymore, I, I find that intriguing. And also, um, if you use clothing that's, um, you know, special to different people, then it's almost like quilts where you're incorporating those memories into it. This piece is called, um, it's not what it seems. And it has a really sort of a nice story to it. It's made with the seams from cashmere sweaters. And um, early on when I was um, first started rug hooking, I was doing some of the big craft shows um, in the US. And I was in uh, Boston, I think, at the Craft Boston show. And a woman walked into my display booth and said, I have a business where um, I make cashmere clothing and I have waste from my business. I want it to be a zero waste business. Would you like to buy my scraps? Oh, wow. And I sort of looked at her and I thought, oh, you know, I don't know. And then she explained to me that they were the seams from the sweaters with the buttons and the care tags still attached. And so, of course, I wanted to experiment. So she sent me this big bag and I made a few pieces um, from these. They're very, it's very soft, it's very dense. Um, and, um, and so maybe a year or a year and a half after that, I was doing another show in Baltimore. And again, she walked into my booth and said, oh, you're here, so am I. So um, I'm going to send people who are in, you know, buying my clothing over to see what you've done with the seams. And so I did the same, send people to look at her clothing. So her business is called Ecologic and she's still um, making beautiful, beautiful clothing out of cashmere sweaters. So if anybody's interested, um, you know, look her up. She's located in Troy, New York, and she's still doing the craft shows. And it's Echo, E C O logic. Echo, Echo logic, E C O L O G I C. Oh, okay. I'll have to look that up. Yeah. Well, I love it. And I also like your design that you have the tags at the top, but you don't have them at the bottom. Oh, it yeah. really gives more depth to it, doesn't it? Now, um, this next image shows you on a ladder, I believe. That's where we are. Okay. And I wanted to show this because what you do is physically taxing. I mean, it's very, you use your hands a lot um, and you do these very large pieces. So as you can see, you have to get up and down a ladder. How do you take care of yourself? Because we were talking with someone last week and he gave up part of his, his artwork because he just couldn't do it anymore. It's, it was too hard on his hands. How do you take care of yourself so that doesn't happen? Well, it is very physical. You know, when you think rug hooking, you think just, you know, sitting in something very relaxing. It is relaxing. It is meditative to actually do the work. But um, the pieces themselves are very heavy. So there's some heavy lifting. But um, also, you know, sitting in a chair for long periods of time, I think, you know, doing artwork or at a computer or anything um, is hard on your body. So I've been trying to um, get up a lot, um, walk around. Um, I've been having trouble, you know, periodically with my hands or my arm. And so I do arm exercises um, before I sit down to hook. Um, mm. For eye strain, I try to look up and look at a distance every so often, which I think is supposed to help. Um, a couple of days ago, I just got a cortisone shot in my thumb from uh -oh. overuse. <laughs> so I think every year I add a little bit more and more of things I have to do to try to, you know, stay in shape. Um, but, you know, it's worth it. I think, you know, it just makes you aware of, you know, how you're using your body. Absolutely. 
So when COVID hit, I'm curious, I'm always hearing, curious to hear how, what people did during COVID. What was COVID like for you? Did you find you shut down? Did you get more work done? What was that like for you? Well, it was hard for a lot of people. Um, it was hard for me too. Um, we lost my mother, not to COVID, but to Alzheimer's. And then my husband and I both had some serious medical um, issues, which we are both fine now. But it also, um, it also gave us time to, um, I'm always in my studio anyway. And so instead of having distractions or feeling guilty about not doing certain things, I was able to get a lot of work done. And um, so this is um, one of the pieces that was in progress then. It's actually three panels like this. It's one of the portraits in the series. Um, it's about a friend of mine who's a real wordsmith. And over the years, I would write down all these crazy sayings that she said. And so there are three panels, two like this, and then one, an actual portrait of her. And it's 18 feet long. So this was um, a major accomplishment. And I also um, was able to get a, a couple small pieces done for some gallery shows. So I did, I did get a lot of work done. It was not a bad time for me in other ways. <laughs> I love that idea of recording what people say is kind of like their overall portrait, not just their visual, but yeah, things that, that's a great idea. That's really how I think of her because she, um, I don't know anybody else like that who always has a saying for every situation. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have got tons of questions. So before we get to the questions, I wanna know what's next for you? Um, working on the portraits, I have three more to get done. Um, and I should be done by the end of 2024. And then I'm my major um, project is to find a location in Connecticut near me where I want to for the exhibit to um, open, because I want to have a big celebration and invite all the women who are involved in the series. So that's um, proving to be a challenge at the moment, but I'm hoping that that will happen. I'm also um, teaching a new rug hooking workshop at Snow Farm in October, which I'm excited about. And I think that um, in the spring I'll be doing something, I'm not sure quite what yet, at a um, rug hooking guild in Maryland. So that's, that's pretty much it for me, I think, so far for the coming year. That's plenty. Yeah. Now plenty. these are in-person workshops, they're not- um, In-person, yeah. yeah, I don't do-, do Snow it. Farm, huh? Yeah, Massachusetts. If, you, if you're all interested, you know, check that out. Yeah, it's a great place. All right, well, let's hit some questions here. We've got a bunch. This may take a while. Um, oh, Anna Peppard wants to know who are or were your mentors in textiles, in particular, your rug hooking mentors? Um, well, question. as I mentioned, Pat Maracayo, who first um, interested me. Um, I don't really want to mention people because I don't want to, you know, like have favorites or anything. But I think um, people who um, there's a lot of people who I've been inspired for different reasons, mm -hmm. um, and even some traditional rug hookers, you know, because um, I'm always curious about different techniques. And the first group of people that I um, hooked with after my teacher were people who had been hooking together for about thirty years, and I was the newbie. So, um, you know, I learned an awful lot of technique. And um, so I would say almost everybody that I meet, I, I think I learned something from. Oh, wow, that's great. 30 years, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah, it is amazing. Well, Anne also wants to know, um, do you use a frame to do your work? Or are you sitting yeah. on your lap? Well, that photograph kind of gave you an idea of what you do for the larger ones, but do the smaller ones, do you use a frame? Are they always vertical or? No, they're all done on my lap in a small frame. I okay. What's called a Puritan frame. Um, even the large ones, everything. Um, I've tried other different ways, but I've that's how I learned and that's what works for me. Okay. Uh, Linda wants to know, oh, we already asked that about the red polka dot. Um, what is the size of the first one you showed? Oh, that's the Memorial to the Sandy Hooks, ICU. How big is oh, that one? Oh, um, it's taller than me. Wow. Um, you know, it's, on, it's on my website. You can look okay. it up and find it. You know, part of it is on the wall and part of it's on the floor. So, um, you know, it's got a depth to it as well as a height. 
It's probably about eight feet, I think, something like that. I meant to ask, now that you mentioned that, why did you decide to make it floor and wall? Um, well, I think wall, because that's, um, you're looking into it, like you have to sort of step into it, and the, and the floor, because I needed to plant the flowers, and I guess I really wanted it to be more of an installation than a flat piece. Yeah, it does. It's very inviting that you just want to go into it. Um, oh, what do you use for backing? What is your cloth? Linen. Linen. Mm -hmm. Is that hard to find? Well, there's rug hooking suppliers. Okay. Um, you know, mostly everything is online. There are rug hooking shows every so often, um, but if you don't live near one, then um, online suppliers are a good source. Or who do you usually use? Who are the like top three or something? If oh, somebody wanted to get started, where should they go? Oh, well, um, the, the linen that I was buying was, isn't available anymore from the person oh. I used to buy it from. So I just bought new linen um, from Door Mill Store, which is in New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. They sell a lot of wool. They're known for that. Um, I like to work on white bleached linen, which not everybody does, um, because when I'm working with color, um, if the linen is beige or brown, every color that I add is compared to the backing color. So I like working on white because then it gives me like a clean palette. Mm. Um, Sue Sari, hi Sue. Thinking about the wood pile image with the positive negative space, you challenged yourself in several ways, creative cutout space, et cetera. Was there a plan B if the cutaway was not successful? Good no. thinking, Sue. No. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure, huh? This had to work or that's it. <laughs> Right. Um, the piece structure was compromised. Uh, way too much work to put in an oh well pile. <laughs> <laughs> true, Sue. Very true. I usually find a way out of things, you know, and sometimes yeah. if something doesn't work, it leads you to something else. I love your, your, I don't know that curiosity is the word, but it's like, you're really good at, I'm going to make this work and let me figure this out. Whereas some people, I get so frustrated that so I, I, I admire that, that you, you go in there and find the solution. I love that. Um, Lisa Schweitzer said, I grew up calling this method of hooking tufting versus the method that makes a knotted rye type rug being called hooking. Is that the reverse of what it should be? Well, the, the ones with the knots are, um, they came from a Swedish you know, or Norwegian tradition raya knots mm -hmm. uh, with people you know people who used yarn traditional rug hooking started in this country using scraps um, from fabric that was made from clothing because it was so precious back then you know mm -hmm. um so i mean now there's different ways that traditional rug hooking that i do is wool fabric that's cut into strips mm -hmm. and then it's made you know looped with a hook that's like a crochet hook so it's just forming loops there's no knots then there's punch needle, which has gotten pretty popular, which is with yarn, or you can do it with strips, and that's punching rather than using a hook. Um, and then there's this new tufting that everybody's doing with the tufting guns, you know, which makes, I guess, both things. And um, so I'm not sure exactly. Can you tell me again what she what she asked? I think she's just wanting clarification on the terminology. Oh, oh okay. And then there's latch hook. I don't even know if anybody does that anymore. Well, yes, latch, latch hook is the the initial one with the um, that I was talking about where it makes a knot. Yeah, with, with yarn. Yeah. Yeah, I was in Michaels this weekend, and they have a tufting gun. Oh really? I can't believe it. Yeah. Wow. Wow. It's everywhere. It is. It's very popular. <laughs> Um, how big are the rugs? This is from Jane. And Jane, I'm going to direct you back to the website, right, Liz? Go look on the website because they're all different there. sizes, right? right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's hard to tell online, but what are your materials? Are you hooking with strips of materials or yarn? You use material, right, wool? I do. Wool, but okay. sometimes I, I use yarn um, to create a different texture or if it happens to be the right color. Um, so they're mixed. I've mixed with all kinds of things. I've mixed with, with everything from like grass and weeds to shoelaces to balloons to like anything that, you know, that I could pull up with a hook. Um, again, what is the size of the rug? 
Um, I like the compass rose with four norths. Would you talk about the other two pieces shown on with the milk thistle, please? Okay. I'm assuming okay. that was the basket. And then you had that um, right. kind of a rose thing. Right. The other piece, the one that had um, the compass on it, was actually punch needle embroidery. And so that was made with silk and cotton and linen threads. Mm -hmm. um, hey, Mandy, can we pull that back up? I'm not sure which number it is, but if you can find that slide, that'd be great. With the three images, with the thistle. I don't know if she'll be able to or not, but keep going. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. That's OK. Um, and the basket was made with uh, willow branches. She's so good. <laughs> she is good. The, um, the basket's made with willow branches um, that I stripped from my yard. And then the milk thistle I already talked about. So the compass um, was made for a gallery show um, that had a theme. I'm trying, I can't remember the theme off the top of my head, but these were all things from my garden. Um, you know, things that, um, that I see in nature. And um, it's always pointing to true north because when I'm out in the garden, it's always right. I'm always headed in the right direction. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I love, I, I, I'm embarrassed to say, I didn't realize that was a compass. And now that you say uh -huh. that, it's like, oh, of course it is. Uh -huh. Um, oh, do you have any thoughts on people being able to touch your pieces when they're on display? Excellent question, Kathy Hefferty, I think. That's a good question. It is a good question. I don't mind. Um, You're so nice. Well, you know, unless somebody had dirty hands, you know, yeah. getting chocolate or something, but, you know, rugs usually um, are, you know, at least the ones that are functional are on the floor anyway. Um, so I don't. I don't have a problem with that. Um, I'm not sure what this means. Uh, Michelle Sonnenfeld said 2026 show, and she's got a question mark. Liz mentioned the Ruth piece will be in there, I'm oh, assuming. Oh, yeah. So do you have a place yeah. in 2026, or you just yeah. think it'll take you that long? No, actually, I have two um, places lined up. Um, oh, OK. Yeah, so first, they're going on exhibit. Um, at the Holter Museum of Art in Helena, Monta Montana. Oh, and then okay. they will travel to the Wisconsin Museum of Quilts and Fiber Arts. And I'm hoping that they're gonna travel more than that. But um, my first priority is to find a place for it to open in 2025. And then in Connecticut. I, in Connecticut. And then I will pursue uh, other venues. So are you Connecticut people? Get yes. out there and let's find this place. <laughs> um, Susan Hall wants to know, do you have a daily sketching practice? Um, no. Do you keep a journal? Um, I mostly take photographs. Hmm. Um, not that I work from them directly, but it's just sort of a way of, of capturing my day. Um, I do draw sometimes. Um, I think mostly I store things away in my head. Um, Sort of like when I take a picture, um, like I was talking about when my sister-in-law's camera clicked, it's like when I take a picture, it's in my head and then I sort of store it away. And then like when I sit down to do something, I sort of bring that up again. Um, how wide are your strips of cloth? Do they vary? They do vary. Um, for anybody who's a rug hooker, they know, you know, there's different cartridges that you plug in everywhere from a three to an eight. So I do the wide variety, whatever works um, is what I use. How do you cut them? I know I'm not supposed to ask those kind of questions. That's okay. Do you, do you have one of those electric knives? <laughs> no, oh. never heard of that. There's, um, it looks like an old fashioned pasta machine, you know, yeah. hand crank and you feed the wool in. Do you really? Yeah. That's a lot to crank out. Well, not really. You go, you do it as you go, because um, if you did a whole bunch and then you changed your color, you would end up with this um. whole bunch of stuff that, you, you know, which people end up with baskets of that anyway. But um, you try just to cut what you need at the time. Again, people do not realize how much work goes into these. Uh, Nancy wants to know, how big was the plexiglass with the thistle? Again, it's on my website. I'm terrible about sizes, so 
Is it like your height? Was it that tall at least? Um, or is it small? Well, no, because it sits on the pedestal usually. And um, oh, okay. All right. I know I'm gonna say four feet, but I'm not really sure. Oh, Mary Madison wants to know how do you decide which shows to do and how many? Um well, I guess it depends, you know, like this year, um, there's things that I'm not entering that I might, might like to because I don't have the work for it because I'm concentrating mm -hmm. on the portraits. Other times it might be because it's a location that I want to be visit myself or um, I know a, a variety of words, maybe, you know, it might be somebody, a juror who, you know, I'd like to see my work. Um, I guess it's just a, a variety of reasons. Do you still do art shows too? Meaning? Craft shows. Didn't you do craft shows? Yeah, I, I'm not doing the craft shows anymore. Yeah. Those two are physically. Very physically art. demanding and very expensive to do too. And with all my work, um, I had a, a, um, a wooden booth. So it all had to be assembled when I got there and I had to rent a truck to get there. And it, it's, it was a lot of work. See, that's when you think maybe I should make little tiny things. Yeah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Those rocks are heavy, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. Beautiful, but beautiful. Um, I know that your kids are artists. Oh, really? This is from Laura Salome. Okay. Do you know her? Um, do they rug hook at all? Um, no. My son is a graphic designer in New York. Yep. Has his own business, yep. And my daughter um, has started her own business too with textiles. She's doing um, things for the home, pillows, tea towels, things like that. So she's she's designing her fabrics. She's a weaver. No, she she um, she she um, designs the fabrics and then she has them printed. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. She went to school for metals, so she was a, a jewelry designer for a while there. Oh, okay. Was, branched off. Um, somebody's asking about teaching. You've already talked about that. Now, is all of that on your website? You're where you're going to be teaching? Um, yes. Okay. What do the, this is a very good question, Mary Holmes, and I should have asked this. What do the extraordinary ordinary women you chose have in common if it's not too early to talk about it. Oh, no, well, I'm glad that you asked that question. Um, they are all women that I know and I admire. And so they've all were chosen. Like if I was going to, you know, pick people now, I would keep going with more women. Mm -hmm. But um, there was a certain cutoff time. And um, it's been an interesting project because the, even though I know most of these women really well, there were other parts to this um, sort of exhibit that I have in my head. And I asked um, for each of the women to have another woman friend or a family member write a short bio about them. So sort of telling about their life. So I learned all kinds of things about these people that I had no idea. And so, you know, my idea is that, you know, when these are up and I'm hoping that the bios would be up, you know, next to the portraits that people will also think about all the women in their lives and, you know, be more curious about um, who they are. And, um, you know, our world is so crazy right now. We don't really take the time to, you know, know who's around us and, and get to know them more. And so that's sort of um, what I'm hoping will, you know, come out of this. Oh, that's wonderful. What do they think about being part well, of your display? Or do they know? Yes, they all know because okay. they all, um, I went and interviewed all of them before I did their portraits. I asked them questions. I photographed them. Um, and, you know, I've had correspondence with them over the years. Um, some of them, only a couple of them have been exhibited. So all they've seen are little bits and pieces. So mm -hmm. I think there's only one person who's actually seen her portrait so far. So hopefully when we have this exhibit in Connecticut, it'll be like the unveiling and everybody will get to see what they look like. <laughs> well, I wish I lived near Connecticut. Or I wish it would come near me. I would love to see that exhibit. Yeah. And we will keep an eye on it. Be sure you let um, HTA know that it's coming out. Okay. Because we always list it in the magazine. And then we also have the calendar online. Okay. We'd okay. love to have that information. 
Okay. And I'm going to start finding some place you can have it here so I can come see. Okay. <laughs> Do that. I'll come. <laughs> okay. All right. I can't believe we've got to stop today. I really enjoyed talking with you. And thank you so much. Sorry for the technical difficulties. You handled it beautifully. We appreciate that. Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me. It was wonderful. Again, go to Liz's uh, website, lizalbertfay.com. But I don't have it up here, but go to her Instagram. Oh my gosh, gorgeous, gorgeous pictures of her work. And you're going to see how prolific she is. This woman works. Um, but check that out. And thank you so much for being on here today. And then we want to thank your sponsor. And I hope she is as tickled with this episode as I am, Patricia. Thank you so much for being a sponsor of Textiles and Tea today. Uh, we appreciate it. And as we said earlier, if you would like to sponsor Textiles and Tea or your guild or your business, please let us know. Go to our website, weavespendie.org, and you can um, sign up to sponsor a particular date. If there's someone you have in mind, just let me know and we'll talk. We'll talk. So thank you so much, Patricia, for being our sponsor today. Convergence is coming. Convergence is coming. If you haven't heard about it, check your mailbox because in the new magazine, uh, Shuttle Spin on Die Pot, the registration book is in there, or you may get the registration book all by itself. Um, you can also watch, see it online if you haven't gotten it in your mailbox yet. So start figuring out what you want to attend. Get your schedule figured out. Uh, be sure you get your hotel reservation in. The rooms are filling up fast. We've got some great hotels right there by the convention center, many to choose from. But there's all kinds of things that you can do. You know, there's, there's the classes, there's the exhibits, there's shopping. We love shopping. Uh, and you can check that all out in the registration book. Like I said, you're either getting it in your mailbox. If you haven't gotten it already, you'll get it soon. And it's online as a PDF. You can download it, print it out. Uh, and go back and use it over and over again. Just a reminder that October 23rd, everything opens up, registration opens up. If you are a Fiber Trust donation person, if you've donated to Fiber Trust, um, you, if you've donated $100 or less, you get uh, October 15th. People who've donated over $300 will get to register October the 9th. You still have time to get in there and make a donation. If you see a class that for you, that's it. You want to have that class for convergence. You might want to consider being a don make a donation to Fiber Trust. If not, there are plenty of classes that will be available on October 23rd. So come join us. Um, like I said, rooms are filling up July the 11th through the 17th. Be sure you get in there and you get your room reservations. I want to thank everybody for your donations to the Fiber Trust and to making your membership or sponsoring events. Uh, those are the ways that we can keep these programs going and add new programs. And we do appreciate all of you who have done what you can to support HGA. Thank you so much. If you've missed an episode, you can watch it again if you want to see this one again. And you can see the interesting problems with Zoom. <laughs> I thank you all for being so patient today through all of that. Um, you can go back and watch old episodes. We will get them on. Um, uh, they'll be on Facebook Live, the HGA Facebook page, and you can also watch them on HGA YouTube. Um, we will have um, somebody new next week. Um, uh, sorry, Corey Alston. If you have heard of Sweet Grass Basketry out of the Charleston, uh, Southern South Carolina, Northern Georgia area, you will see him next week. And he does incredible. His whole family does beautiful sweet grass baskets. So that will be next week. I hope you all have a wonderful week. Thank you so much for being here again. Sorry for the glitches, but we muddled through it. Have a great week and happy tea.